Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Play season-long best ball. Fantasy drafts where you only focus on the most fun part of fantasy, drafting your team. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. Underdog handles the rest for you. No waivers, trades, or setting your lineups each week. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100 get a hundred dollars free that's promo code radio terms and conditions apply hi guys sam here on the 1st of april i'll be raising money for sick disabled and disadvantaged aussie kids by taking part in the variety spin for kids charity day last year i was able to raise over 500 dollars as part of my team's two thousand dollar goal with a number of incredible donations from people around the internet wrestling community this year i hope we could do it again Variety are a great charity that are able to step in when government support doesn't reach people in need, providing things like wheelchairs, communication and hearing aids, medical services, therapy and more for young kids. If you'd like to get behind Variety and support my ride, there will be a link in the podcast description and also on my Twitter. Thanks in advance, but now let's hit the music and get on with the show. Welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast, where we deep dive into the best matches in AEW history. Brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network and your host, Sam Brown. Yes, hello and welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Brown. Thank you for joining me. Every week, alongside a special guest, I take an in-depth look at one of the best matches in AEW history, taken from the definitive AEW Match Guide, as ranked by over 30 wrestling commentators from around the internet wrestling community. If you enjoy the show today, you can subscribe and rate it on your podcast app of choice, and make sure you check out all of the other great shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network that cover all aspects of the world of pro wrestling. My guest for today is the founder of Pro Wrestling Musings, one of the leading pro wrestling stats sites on the internet, the great Craig Williams, and we're looking at Jungle Boy versus Dax Harwood from Dynamite on the 27th of January, 2021. How are you today, Craig? Yeah, not doing too bad. A little nervous. It's the first time I've done a podcast in quite some time, but yeah, should be good. No problem. I'm sure you'll you'll slip into this like an old pair of boots. <laughs> uh, the, the first question I ask all of my guests on here, Craig, is how did you get into AEW? Um, so I got into AEW via... Uh, right, well, right at the beginning, really, uh, New Japan Pro, Pro Wrestling to begin with. Um, and then, you know, a uh, favorite wrestler at the time was Kenny Omega. Big fan of the Okada matches. Um, followed, you know, the kind of year or two of that before AEW started. Um, kind of ended up there via kind of the guys that left the WWE. So when Jericho was be- getting involved with New Japan, um Cody Rhodes doing the Ring of Honor stuff and ending up there. It was kind of that's that's how I ended up there. And you know, once you're fans of all these guys and they're they're you know they leave the company that you're watching and go off to make their own thing. It's it's you know that's kind of that's where you end up looking. Um, here we are. Yeah, it's I mean that's a pretty common thread that a lot of people have had. Uh, one thing yeah. I did want to ask you though is you've probably had a pretty unique fandom in that what you do uh, on pro wrestling musings for those of you who don't know craig or haven't followed him uh he meticulously tracks stats from the matches that happen in all across pro wrestling but primarily AEW has been the main one that you've focused on Uh, and i'm curious how you feel like that has shaped and affected your fandom of AEW. yes that's interesting i think about that quite a lot actually um, so when I watch wrestling now, it's qu- it's different from how most people do. There are plenty of people that will sit and take notes because there's lots of people that cover wrestling on YouTube or via podcast or whatever. I actually made my own shorthand type thing that I can quite easily track what happens in a match. So 
if you've come across my stuff before, it's uh, I'm the person that comes up with the the graphics that show how much strikes, grapples, dives, etc. happen in a wrestling match. So when I watch wrestling, I can do that at the same time. Um, it's easier than it sounds once you've done it a bunch of times. It's essentially just counting really with flourish and <laughs> counting I, I'm with always, style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, but I'm I'm also somebody that's always had quite like a short attention span. So I like growing up, I would be somebody that would sit watching a film or a TV program whilst playing football manager on the laptop or something. Like I've always kind of struggled to, I don't know, just to hold my own attention. And with wrestling, it, it kind of, it's always taken like the really good stuff to make me want to watch the whole match and not just start skipping up ahead. So coincidentally, um, the way that I now watch wrestling kind of makes me, it kind of clues me in a lot more. It makes me kind of really want to watch every second of it. And yeah, I, I, I kind of, when I watch wrestling now without noting down every single instance of what happens, um, it feels different. So yeah, I don't know if it's completely ruined the process of watching it for me. And um, as it <laughs> happens, like, most of my favorite wrestling matches I watched before I started doing this, but that might just be a coincidence of the timing of the pandemic and the fact that like 2017, 18 was, you know, a particularly good time period. Needless to say, all of that makes you a fantastic follow on Twitter because instead <laughs> of sitting watching the show and, and sending off absolutely mindless and very in early thought through tweets, like saying, oh, I, 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 I do that too. I do that too. Oh, look, this is a man of many talents. I want to, like, get a live stream of you watching Dynamite one day. That's <laughs> not particularly <laughs> interesting. <laughs> we probably should get into the match at some point here. Um, as I said, it's Jungle Boy versus Dax Harwood from Dynamite on the 27th of January 2021. Uh, as we always do, we introduce it by giving the match its flowers. Dave Meltzer gave it 4.5 of the big ones. Cage match rank it at 7.9 and when we did the aw match guide back in 2021 after double or nothing it uh didn't actually make the top 50 uh so my question craig is you've picked a match that didn't fall into the top 50 of the definitive match guide uh i'm looking forward to diving into it of course but i do want to know why in particular given all of the matches you could cover you wanted to cover this one because it was very good <laughs> so wrestling is scripted and they do a lot of the same things a lot of times to get to where they're going often western wrestling and even new japan now um use rule breaks etc to as a bit of a crutch what i would suggest others might disagree um this match you didn't know what the result was going to be jungle boys on the up but dax could credibly beat him because he's part of a top tier a plus tag team um and and it felt like that in the match because they're really going back and forth this is a match that i am using my kind of uh, what i do this is a match that had loads of reversals they're reversing each other all of the time and for me when i'm watching wrestling it, that seems to be something that really draws me in i like kenny omega okada i like johnny gargano versus andrade from nxt i like matches where it really feels like the two guys are so evenly matched undergoing back and forth at quite a frenetic pace um i'm not a big fan of kind of prolonged beatdown spots i i find that i kind of tune out at that point there's a match that got the wrestling observer match of the year way back in the early 90s and um, it's jushin thunder liger versus Naomi Sano, uh, I don't know if that's the first name, but Sano's his name. Um, that's the guy that Liger tagged with in his last match. And that match is essentially a 15 to 20 minute beatdown where Sano, after the first minute or two where Justin Liger takes him apart, Sano controls the match for like 15 minutes. And just, it's like, it's an incredible beatdown, but you do find yourself kind of, it's a lot of the same thing for a lot of time. But Liger's a mess by the time. And in the last minute or two, Liger has a comeback, hits a bunch of big moves and wins the match. 
so for me that's really not what i look for it's just that kind of almost breaks the immersion that's kind of a little bit hard to believe that this guy who's just been on top for 15 minutes can can lose if that makes sense i don't want to feel like an idiot when i'm watching my wrestling yeah look i I get where you're coming from and i think when we dig into this match we'll definitely see what you're talking about the seesawing nature of it yeah the constant flip-flopping of who's in control and what's going on the really even nature of it and even when you know there are sort of sort of what you'd call i guess like heat sections in this it's not done by cheap cheap tricks uh and it's done in an aggressive and in a quick moving fashion. So I think we're going to get into that. So, yeah, as I said, even though this didn't make the top 50, I'm I'm really excited to get into this because <laughs> it's a great match in itself. And I think also historically and narratively, it's go, it's uh, going to become even bigger and bigger as we move forward. So I'm, I'm really happy to be to digging into it on this podcast here. To introduce the different wrestlers, um, we'll, int- we'll we'll talk about Jungle Boy first because he was the first of these two to show up in AEW. Of course, um, there are very few people that showed up in AEW on a pay per view before Jungle Boy because he was in the buy in in the Casino Battle Royale at Double or Nothing 2019. After that, he quickly paired up with Luchasaurus and Marco Stunt to form Jurassic Express. Uh, And over the early events and Dynamites, they lost a lot, but they were featured as like this really wholesome and and an act that became beloved very quickly. Uh, And off the back of that, Jungle Boy even got a 10-minute match with AEW champ Chris Jericho, at the time AEW champ, where it was like, can he survive for 10 minutes without getting pinned? Craig, what were your earliest impressions of the Jungle Boy in AEW, or if you discovered him before that? Um, I didn't discover him before that. It was just via AEW. Um, he he came across really well to begin with. Obviously, he's got quite a distinguishing look, um, and he was like he kind of ticks a lot of my boxes and what I look for. He's exciting. He moves quickly. Um, he does a lot of exciting things. And then obviously AEW do quite a, a good job of highlighting the guys that they want you to notice. So he showed up a lot um, on the early Dynamites, whilst, as you said, um, not not winning. Yeah, my my first thought was uh, I didn't like the name, thought it was a stupid name. So <laughs> I, was, I was actually very happy when JR started calling Jungle Boy Jack Perry. I, I actually really liked it when that happened. And, you know, uh-huh. as 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 the fan base does it blew up at the time and i was kind of just like oh i like this uh weird tights at the time i didn't like his tights I've sort of come around on that um and, and i thought he was really athletic but i did think he was bland pretty bland as a character but when i saw him paired up with lucha saurus and marco stunt i immediately was just like this is a great idea these guys are just the most pure and lovely act and of course you've got marco stunt being bullied and them sticking up for him i, I really love that and you know, one of the things that I've been sad about this year in in AEW is that they have pulled Marco Stunt back. There's all sorts mm. of reasons for that that, you know, is to do with Marco and what he's, his career ambitions are and things like that. But for me, I, I loved that. I thought that combination worked so perfectly yeah. uh, and was so wholesome, so beloved. And they, even though they lost, um, they always just had so much fire and they always fought for each other so well. Uh, and I loved, I loved that aspect of that that sort of partnership and, and pairing that they had. Of course, as as I said, he they did lose a lot early on, but more and more, particularly Jungle Boy, was, was shown to be the standout performer in this. Uh, as I said, he got that match with Chris Jericho early on. Throughout 2020, he had more solo... Uh, solo exploits including um the match with M- a singles match with mjf at double or nothing uh, and the the tag team started to pick up steam as well they they got some wins they got into positions where they were you know close to being in title contention they had some t- they even had some title matches uh for the tag championships what did you think of the progression of jungle boy through 2020 sort of leading up to um 2021 the, the start of 2021 when this match happens yeah, so he, he that's when he started to take off, wasn't it? Um, yeah. The, the the match that you mentioned against Jericho, I believe um, he was given that match because Jericho essentially laughed in his face because he had like a, I don't know, he was on a 10 match losing streak or something, but it was something mm. substantial and um, maybe even like one of the worst at the time, which is why Jericho was like, yeah, sure. Can you last 10 minutes? I can't actually remember too much of his 2020 I, I can remember that he did start to pick up wins, and I believe he did it really quickly, possibly in January of that year. 
Um, but yeah, I, um, I couldn't, which is maybe um, an answer to your question. I can't really remember too much of his 2020. Mm. I don't know how affected he was by the pandemic, if he fell away during that early part. There was obviously the match against Cody, so he won a battle royale. Uh, There's a really cool sequence with Phoenix at the end of that battle royale um, to be the first guy that challenged Cody for the uh, TNT Championship, and that was yep. a big moment for him. And then Cody, like, did in proper melodramatic kind of Cody way, um, which I I really love about the Cody character. At the end of the match, Cody was like pinned him and then like threw himself on top of Jungle Boy to like hug him. Which, after after which, blading and then having giant yes, fireworks yes, at the end. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. As I said, very Cody. Um, Everything in a bag of chips. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So Cody put him over big, and that's and was he was the first guy that Cody put over like that in Cody's long run of putting guys over because that's what Cody does because he's not Triple H, but that's that's uh-huh. another topic. So he's he's ended up at this point with Dax Harwood where he could he could um, logically lose here but um yeah that's not how things played out yeah absolutely and of course Dax Harwood he debuted in 2020 to to big fanfare alongside Cash Wheeler as FTR jumping across from the WWE uh, where they were known as the Revival and of course had that giant online Twitter feud with the Young Bucks that lasted forever. And we covered back in uh, a, a number of podcasts ago. That was a long time ago in the history of this this podcast, well, the short history of this podcast. But Dax Harwood is a friend of the show. Shouted out this show uh, after we posted that podcast. So shout outs to Dax Harwood. Uh, and I've got nothing but good was things to say about him because digging, of that. <laughs> was he digging, um, digging the Luke? What? Was he digging your Luke? Oh, 100%. Yeah. He, him and... <laughs> Him and I are basically brothers. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the bald the bald man with the yeah, beards. Yeah. It's a good it's a good look. Absolutely, he 100 percent endorses this podcast, and I endorse that look. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but look, they of course much more high profile than Jurassic Express in 2020. They sort of run roughshod, really, over the tag division after debuting, uh, which climaxed in them becoming tag champions in All Out. Uh, Jurassic Express, interestingly, were their first match after they won the titles uh, on the 10th of December. And after that, they would go on to have a slew of um, more contenders matches. Uh, They called them a brush with greatness, where they would have a championship match with all of these different tag teams in AEW. Uh, FTR would then lose the titles against the Young Bucks at Full Gear, uh, and Jurassic Express and FTR would clash again on January 7th, which is a match that would set up the match that we look at today, uh, because of course <laughs> FTR won, but fit with interference from Tully uh, and shenanigans from both of the boys, so it was declared that they would uh, stick some handcuffs on Luchasaurus and Tully and Cash Wheeler. And Dax Harwood and Jungle Boy would get in the would get in the ring solo against one another. Yeah, Just before which... we get directly into the match, do you have any memories at all of the the matches these guys had? Um, not enormously, but I would assume that they were great. I really can't remember the matches. What I can remember is the reaction to the booking of this match online. Like, mm. so we're gonna have this match, and then we're gonna handcuff these two guys to a dinosaur, um, rather than just everyone's banned from ringside. Now, looking back, they did it so that they could have the visual of Tully and Cash really wanting to help Dax and not being able to because of the giant dinosaur. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I can remember listening to, you know, as you do beforehand podcasts. And it was it was kind of and I, and I kind of, you know, it was an eyebrow raiser and I was one of the people also raising an eyebrow. Um, but then this was a taped match, I believe. And mm. it was as they did with some of the tape matches, they it kind of leaks like you have to mm. watch this match. It's really, really good. And people are like, the one with the handcuffs and the dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, watch this match. And, you know, they were, they were correct. Absolutely. Uh, I'd just say with the tag team matches they had before, uh, these two teams are just a really natural pairing uh, because of the way that Jurassic Express operate. Uh, with having, you know, the the big high-impact high guy in Luchasaurus yeah. who can hit in, like, really powerful but short bursts. And then your, your smaller, high-flying technician in Jungle Boy. It, it makes for just such a natural pairing for a team like Cash and Dax, FTR, who cut off the ring, who, like, use underhanded tactics to really prevent that 
that tag that hot tag from happening whether it's jungle boy finally getting the tag to the big fella on the outside or the big fella being able to get out of the match after they've absorbed his his offense and worn him down and taken advantage of this guy who's you know even though he can hit hard he can also be taken down and taken advantage of once you've weathered that early storm so just really natural adversaries and and I think these guys, these two teams are going to have great matches for a long time because of that. It reminded me a little bit of um, the Revival had a really great match with Enzo and Cass mm. uh, and, and okay. sort of a, a very similar dynamic that, that you've got between the two. Um, of course, Jungle Boy and Enzo couldn't be much further from... Div- much, no, very, slight, they're two different. very, very different performers, <laughs> but uh, similar, similar sort of dynamic there. As we said, um, this match happened, it was pre-recorded. Uh, it happened on the 21st of January, but it was air, put to air on the 27th. You mentioned you were hearing on podcasts that people didn't like mm-hmm. the stipulation. How did you feel about the stipulation when you first heard it? Yeah, it was just just a bit odd. Um, I suppose you could just ban the guys from ringside and it has the same effect. That seems mm-hmm. a bit more, I don't know, boring, serious. Um, yeah. I've, I've, it, yeah, I, as I said before, it kind of it was done to achieve a visual of the giant dinosaur mm-hmm. holding them back. I suppose it also for the end, the ending where um, Jungle Boy gets attacked, not Jungle Boy, sorry, Luchasaurus gets attacked at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, there was there was all that too. It, I mean, it all worked out fine, but beforehand mm-hmm. it was a kind of a what what you doing here? Yeah, it didn't make a huge amount of sense. Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of quaint. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh-huh. you know, I didn't have I didn't have strong feelings about it at the time, but sure. yeah, definitely a cool a cool visual scene. And there was also yeah, because of times, of course, Luchasaurus is 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 holding the guys back. But there's times mm-hmm. where they're holding Luchasaurus back because he can see his mate in the ring getting yeah. dominated, and he's like trying to roar to get him to come back. So yeah, look, I think it's high time we get stuck into the match uh, <laughs> because we're we're already jumping in all over the place on this sure. on this podcast today. And I do need, but when we get into the match, I do want to thank Craig because he's he's put his own spin on this. So we're gonna have we're gonna be incorporating the stats that he's got uh, from work that he does into it today. So I do appreciate the time he's taken uh, and if you want to watch along there'll be links in the podcast description and on my twitter where you can pull up the slides that have got the breakdowns of the stats it's really interesting to look at uh, and if you've never seen craig's work this is a great time to to jump in and have a look uh, so ftr and dax they're the first out um, with jungle boy coming out afterwards as i said this made me miss marco stunt and also jungle boy riding his dinosaur to the ring he doesn't do that anymore i guess he's a bit more of a jungle man now but uh that was such a such a cool entrance when they first started doing it uh and you'd have you know the three of them standing there with the fireworks you know just singeing the top of jungle boy's hair (laughs) as they exploded off uh and yeah of course we've got luchasaurus handcuffed to tully and cash forced to sit you know in the corner uh it's kind of looks like almost like an awkward doctor's waiting room uh we've got three different people sitting there very awkwardly trying not to make eye contact (laughs) early on it's really hard lock up and they start trash talking afterwards dak dax pushes jungle boy to the corner before Jungle Boy gets the better of their second interaction with an arm drag. Dax then takes control again, grounding Jungle Boy, and then knocking Jungle Boy down with like a, some big shoulder blocks. But then Jungle Boy, he slips away uh, for the next exchange and gets a drop kick, nearly locks in the snare trap. I, I go over that start move by move just to sort of emphasize the back and forth nature because it really sets the tone um, for the kind of match this is going to be, doesn't it, Craig? How, how do the stats sort mm-hmm. of bear that out? Yeah, yeah, uh, very much so. It's um, reversal after reversal after reversal with um, some submissions and stuff put in there. Um, yeah, uh, you're, it's it's great to mention the like the kind of the hip toss as well that Jungle Boy does because it's a little bit um, the character works really good there as well. It's kind of they're feeling each other out, but Dax kind of is expecting to get the better of this, and then Jungle Boy kind of embarrasses him straight away, which leads to Dax just going straight into like trying to grind him down and using his mm. big shoulder blocks uh, wherever possible. So yeah, uh, great start. Yeah. And, and the things that jungle boy does to get the advantage of the drop kick and the arm drag, the mm-hmm. things that Dax is doing to get the advantage, as we said, the shoulder block and his uh, general strength and power advantage. And, and as I said, this is a real back and forth match. And if you look at the stats, you know, the strikes 30 to 27, 
grapples mm-hmm. seven to six submission times 27 seconds 73 seconds reversals 26 to 26 this is a really even match and that that bears out as this whole match progresses really funny line from the commentators commenting on that visual gag we mentioned tony goes tully's been in a lot of types of situations matches in cages put above cages by the ring (laughs) And Excalibur goes, but has he ever been chained to a dinosaur before? And then JR comes in with yesterday's wrestling meets tomorrow's wrestling. <laughs> I just love, I love <laughs> the the way that just like says so much about all three of the commentators yeah. in one neat little exchange. That's quite um, polite for JR. <laughs> <laughs> very diplomatic, very diplomatic. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to have a dinosaur that's 65 million years old having heat with you, right? You don't want to have heat with that guy. <laughs> no, um, no. Big, big chop exchanges, you know, like really laying it in. There's lots of fire from Dax, lots of fire from Jungle Boy in return. Um, You know, like Dax hits a low blow. They're running the ropes back and forward. Lots of misdirection. It's like real blink and you miss it stuff. One of the things that you track, Craig, is is offense Mm -hmm. per minute. And I'm curious, like how how this match compares uh, and and what sort of rates you're looking at, because this field... This felt very fast paced, particularly early on. Yeah, so this was quite fast paced early on, actually. So um, if you are listening along and you're looking, you have had a look through the the, the stuff. Um, there's a slide that I've put in there where I've compared this match to other AEW matches of a similar ish length. So Danielson, Suzuki, Punk, Kingston, and um, Pack and Drade. And um, so the offense per hour is how much. Um, offense they would do in total if the match went for an hour so this match it's actually quite low for offense per hour it's less than Danielson Suzuki Suzuki less than Punk Kingston and slightly more than Pac Andrade so that's because the Danielson match and the Punk match are kind of slugfests with loads and loads of strikes whereas this match uses strikes strikes don't know what Slake is, strikes more uh, carefully, whereas it's reversal, reversal, maybe four strikes, reversal, reversal, a few more strikes, where quite often in matches you might get um, considerably more strikes before uh, the other guy kind of takes control again, um, where this match does compare favourably to those other matches that I mentioned is in the tide changes. Because this match is so um, reliant on reversals, the tide changes, so the guy that's in control changes so much. So 197 times per hour based on the pace that they're going in quarter of an hour, um, which is slightly less than Danielson Suzuki because they have loads of like back and forth strike battle where it's strike to one guy, strike to other guy. Um, but that's considerably more than Punk Kingston, which is a shorter match. And also considerably more than Pac Andrade, which when you think of a Pac Andrade match, it would be you you expect them to be reversing all the time and moving at such a high pace that so much would be happening. Whereas this one was a faster pace for the match. So you're right to say that it's a incredibly pacey match, but it's um, that's done via the reversals and the struggle for control rather than the actual hitting of moves if that makes mm. sense. Uh, and I guess that that tide change bit that you're mentioning, that sort of is the story of this match, right? Yes, Cause, yes. Because the point of this match is that Jungle Boy is becoming a jungle man and he's going up against a guy like Dax. And like, as I said, as you said, you know, me and Dax share a lot in terms of the way we look. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, 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 one of the things I love about Dax and Cash is I, I think they look – like what wrestlers would look like if wrestling was real. So you were going to say like, like really attractive? Oh, that too. That too. <laughs> <laughs> Especially but, but facts. It, <laughs> if like if wrestling was real, like yeah. they, yeah. you know, they're yeah. thick, they're powerful looking. Uh, they're not like super tall and gangly, um, which in, in I guess in jujitsu, um, that's that's an advantage and also a disadvantage because you've got, you know, limbs sticking out everywhere that someone could grab a hold of. Yeah. But to yeah. me, like, and, and when you look at like the old pictures of like your hack and Schmitz and your gotchas and stuff like that, or even if you look at wrestlers today, like, you know, Kurt Angle, for example, you know, mm-hmm. they're not, 
they're not like the Adonises that you'd see in 80s WWE. They're yeah. guys that look like Dax and Cash. These are guys that look rough. They look ready. They look aggressive. And Dax's offense is like really aggressive as well. And um, there's so much snap to it. And he, you know, he's like constantly trying to control the position of the, even as a singles wrestler, he he's constantly con- trying to control the position of the of his opponent in the ring, the position of the, his opponent's body. You know, like he does this lovely slingshot power bomb off the ropes and he mm. really like, whips it really whips it but jungle boy is going with him like there's this guy yes. who's like this real as we said aggressive hard looking bloke and jungle boy is is going with him and is constantly able to turn the tide and even though like this guy ratchets things up again jungle boy is able to meet him and go past and and that constant changing of the tide is sort of the story of this match and Jungle Boy almost like levels up to Dax because um so in this match Jungle Boy doesn't actually hit any of his high flying moves. He tries like three times and it always gets reversed. And um, what Jungle Boy does do in this match is he hits like loads of suplexes, like German suplexes, and there's another one like a like a belly to belly or something. And and the strikes, Jungle Boy outstrikes Dax in terms of numbers. Um Dax is put over um, in the match by how hard he's striking he kind of downs jungle boy more often with his strikes but there's a lot of instances where dax starts to strike jungle boy and then jungle boy comes right back at him like you were saying and um, with chop like loads of chops and um, mm. particularly overhand overhand chops something that he does a lot um and it looks convincing even though he's this smaller guy there's a riho-ish esque way mm. to how he strikes in this match yeah so it's 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 a completely different match for Jungle when you Boy. say a Riho esque way that he strikes. What do you mean by that? Well, it looks when you look at the guy. So you're talking about Dax as looking like a, a wrestler, like your old fashioned American wrestlers. Um, I, I was kind of thinking 90s Japanese wrestlers, like they're just big guys. That too, yeah. Yeah, like, like there's no six packs, but they look like they could, like you'd want to run away from them. And, um, <laughs> When Riho's in there taking on like Nyla Rose or Chris Statlander, even Britt Baker, somebody that looks so much bigger than him, she looks like a child. And I'd say that Jungle Boy, to me, he's got like quite a teenagerish frame, like a teenager that's into sports, but like a teenager nonetheless. Uh- Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Play season long best ball, fantasy drafts where you only focus on the most fun part of fantasy, drafting your team. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. Underdog handles the rest for you. No waivers, trades, or setting your lineups each week. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100, get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. And it doesn't look like that guy's going to be able to... You expect Dax to get struck a few times, raise an eyebrow and put him down. Um, and that does happen once or twice. But for the most of it, Jungle Boy comes back with these chops and is pushing Dax back towards the corner in the same way that Riho... Riho does it differently in that, to begin with, she's not having much of an effect. And then she gets fired up and it starts and she starts to really lay them in. Uh, but the... The kind of the body size and the the kind of the expectations I'd suggest is quite similar. Yeah, and the way that those slighter people can do it is that they can really contort their body in a way that, like, mm. I guess bigger guys can't, or it doesn't have the same visual effect. Like you can Jungle Boy, also see Rio, their body. Orange Cassidy, like they're you know thin, gangly almost guys, but when they really lean back and 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 let rip, you get yeah. like such a clear visual of like their whole body th- being thrown into something and of course with jungle boy exactly, you've got his yeah. hair flying everywhere as well yeah. which just adds to the visual uh and like this is 
Jungle Boy at this point, you know, he's gone up against, as I said, he has had singles matches, but, you know, it was ultimately, it was like a gimmicky match against Chris Jericho. Can you last 10 minutes yeah. against the champ? Like it wasn't a, and, and the other big singles match he's had was against MJF, which is a guy that's like mm. of his generation. And, it, you know, at that point, MJF, even though he's highly touted, he hasn't won a whole lot of giant matches except for the match against Cody in yeah. they're AEW. On, they're on the level. They're on the exactly. level at that point, yeah. Whereas in this one, as we said, he's up against like this aggressive, powerful man who two months ago was mm-hmm. a champion in this company. And, you know, you don't have your big dinosaur mate to back you. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's off. Cha- he's handcuffed to, to Dax's mates. Um, yeah, this is you've got to do it and you've got to do it alone. And and that's like the story for, for Jungle Boy in this match. You know, what are you going to do? And of course, we get that. A, a really good, a really great final sequence. This isn't a match that sticks around for too long. It goes for about 15 minutes. After after Dak sort of does take, you know, once again takes on, takes sort of offense, puts some punishment down. Jungle Boy fights his way back in. He hits a big headbutt off the top turnbuckle, and then he he does finally hit a, a high flying movie. Hits a crossbody, uh, but that's rolled up, and then they go into a series of of, of pinning combinations. You know, just about he had just about every pitting combination you could think mm. of before Jungle Boy finally locks in the snare trap. Um, and after a brief struggle, Dax taps out. What did you love about? What did you think about the? I'm um, jumping the gun a little bit there, but what did you think about the uh, the final sequence there, Craig? Yeah, it was really good. Um, I liked so this match kind of had a lot of different. Like the beginning of it was very much a struggle back and forth. Then there's like a there is a good heat spot during the ad break. Uh, where Dax use a, uses a couple of quite long submissions. And then they build up to this like almost like suplex struggle where they're all hitting, where they're both hitting loads of suplexes. And then that leads into this kind of pin kind of struggle again, where they're exchanging those. And then Jungle Boy eventually um, traps him. And what I really liked about the the snare trap was he had it in and Dax wasn't tapping. So he then kind of altered it so that he was also... So instead of just making it a neck crank, he um, isolated the arm. So the arm was also being cranked back as well. And then as soon as he did that, Dax immediately tapped, which I thought was quite good. It was it was better than just the guy eventually giving up. It was it was like made worse and it then kind of made it more convincing. And that almost put Dax over in a way as well, as in like his the usual way that he would apply his finisher wasn't working. So he's like made it worse and and that's how uh, that's how he's picked it up. My thought as well around the finishing sequence is is similar in terms of like I love the like you're talking about how it was almost like very realistic how he had to adjust mid mid move and, and I love how the pinning in the pinning combinations these two are, seem to be struggling against each other. Obviously mm. in wrestling we know it's the two people working together and these two are obviously working with one another to, to da- make these moves. But sometimes when you see those sorts of pinning combinations, it's very obviously coordinated and you can see them yeah. like, Oh, yeah, I yeah. let you up and I get into space yes. for me and jumping around yeah. together. But in this case, they did look like they were really pushing against each other, which I don't know that that lended to like an air of authenticity to it. The sequences didn't look mm-hmm. super smooth. And and when jungle boy got that snare trap, I'm not sure if you noticed what he did was as Dax kicked out of one, he used the momentum mm-hmm. of Dax kicking out to flip him over yeah. and, and grab and jump into the snare trap. So I, I love the realistic nature of that. Uh, that yeah, final which, sequence there. That's um that's a very stardom thing. Um, in stardom, almost whenever they kick out of a pinfall, whatever is used to kick out or like if it, the arm goes up or the leg goes up, they almost always grab that and transition into some kind of submission hold, which um, Dakota Kai does it a bit um, in NXT or she did whenever the last time was I watched that. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like that. And, and again, as you're saying, it's realism. Um, Jungle Boy didn't at any point go for or use the when he grabs the arm, hits the chop and does the, like the rope spring, you know what I mean? When he, mm, he bounces yeah. off the rope and that he never did that in this match. And I don't know, um, but I, there's no way I can remember off the top of my head. I don't know if he does it in tag matches against them either, but I do wonder if Dax was just like, yeah, n- not, not for this match. Or... <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll Samoa Joe out of it. <laughs> there's no power to this. Sure. Time. Sure. Yeah. But I, I don't know if it was, when you're talking about the realism of the pins and the struggle that was 
prevalent throughout this match. I, I feel like this was Dax's first singles match or maybe first big singles match in AEW. And I don't know if he was trying to make an impression or supply something different. But yeah, I don't know. I just wonder if that was his influence there. Yeah, I certainly can't remember any other big high profile singles matches Dax had ever had um, mm-hmm. yeah. here or in WWE. I don't know. Maybe he had something on Dark. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure he's probably had at some point, um, but I, I can't remember for the life of me any other high-profile ones that he's had. But certainly made a certainly made a statement in this one. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But but I did like how he, as I said earlier, like even as a singles wrestler, he uh, he wrestled it similarly to how he wrestles in a tag match in terms he of did, like, his yeah. control and ring positioning, which of course, I don't know, it just makes so much sense that of course this guy would, because he's a nasty character, he's a nasty character, but he's also intelligent. Uh, and so mm-hmm. he's not going to, he's going to go, I can't stray too far from what I know because that's what's got me this far so far. And so I'm just going to try and do what I can and, and adapt, but keep as much as will, will be effective and, mm-hmm. you know, very effective in this, in this case. Uh, Post match, of course, we get uh, a bit of a beat down where, Cash, Tully, and Dax, um, they throw powder in Luchasaurus's eyes as soon as they get uncuffed from him. They go after Jungle Boy. They hit a big pile driver on Luchasaurus. And then the nasty bastards, they cut the horns off Luchasaurus's mask. Uh, what did you think of the post-match here, Craig? Um, I, I really liked the, the powder or whatever they threw at Luchasaurus. That was really good. It made more sense for them going for the for Jungle Boy's hair. Um, the the AEW wrestlers must be a really big fan of Jungle Boy's hair because that was the last straw. There was like four or five of them came sprinting out to to save <laughs> Jungle Boy's hair, but nobody nobody cared about the dinosaur horns. Um, I yeah, I suppose I suppose it was like you know this stupid mask. What are you doing? You're a wrestler. Why are you pretending to be a dinosaur? It was probably the vibe you were supposed to take away from it. Just cutting off the horns seemed a bit silly. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't want to be unmasked, but I don't know. I feel like if they're going to like ruin the mask, they should have just like demasked him and you know, t- yeah, just dis- or something. But yeah, whatever. Um, it yeah. it was it was all right. Yeah, I I honestly completely had forgotten that this had happened until I yeah. until it started happening. I was like. Oh, I remember that, but I, I don't yeah, think yeah. they paid it off at all. Like I don't know. Like I don't think he get he got afterwards. he got a wee video. He got a video. Um, there's like a wee video package where there's a mask on like a stone platform, and there's light, and then there's a mask, and then yeah. Luch Source comes out to save some people in a couple of weeks or something. So they did a little bit, but it wasn't wasn't particularly worthwhile. I mean, at the time, I remember thinking, are they trying to set up like some sort of mask versus hair match or something? But, you mm. know, like the problem is Jurassic <laughs> yes. Express has got the best hair and the best mask. In the yeah. What are you going to do? Like shave, shave a worse haircut into cash wheel? <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe well, like a Dax, moustache Dax versus is, mask um, match for well, Dax? I was, yeah, I was about to say Dax is rocking a pretty, pretty good moustache. So maybe <laughs> maybe that's that's to go. My personal favourite of his was the chops and the the mo, but that was that was in a yeah. different place, a different part of his life. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, let's um let's get into the comparisons to other matches mm. and sort of the legacy of this. Um, now you've sort of you as you said you've you've put up some comparison slides uh, and done some comparisons to other matches uh, that people, as I said, it's linked in the description and also you can find it on our on our on my Twitter. Can you talk me through what what you're looking at with the the comparisons you've made here, Craig? Yeah, so um, started converting the numbers into per hour rates because if you're comparing a 15 minute Jungle Boy match with a 19 minute Danielson match, then like the numbers are going to be when you're saying, oh yeah, uh, Brian Danielson got more strikes than Jungle Boy. Um, well, yeah, he wrestled for five minutes longer. That makes sense. So by making it a per hour rate, you kind of flatten out the time differences. So we've got the Danielson, Suzuki, Punk, Kingston. And then for this, we've got Omega and Phoenix. Just just to like so that you can see the numbers and be like, so how does this match compare to some others that have happened? Um, the things that kind of jump out is 
Um, as I suggested before, the strikes are used a little bit more carefully in this one. There's not a huge amount. But what does jump out is that Dax Harwood is using strike downs at a rate that's higher than both Minoru Suzuki, Brian Danielson, and let's add and Kenny, Kenny Omega in there as well, because with his yeah, with his V triggers. So that's that's impressive. Um And that's also Kenny Omega in a match where he's set up as the more powerful and dominant yes. guy. And the thing that's keeping him in that match is like his powerful and ability his power and mm-hmm. his ability to strike down and, and down Phoenix. Exactly, um, that. yeah. So that's that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I don't think when you're when you're given those that selection of matches, you think that the match that's going to have the most grapples in it is going to be this match. This match does out grapple for, for the pace of grapples that are used. Mm. All those other matches, including Kenny Omega, Ray Phoenix, only just, but it does. Um, which, which again, that's that's interesting. And then for there to be zero dives um, in this match. So Jungle Boy, the cross body, I didn't count that because I felt that Dax reversed that enough. He took out enough of the, um, he didn't really mm. take the impact. He rolled it through. So Jungle yep. Boy doesn't actually land any dives properly in that match. Whereas in all of the other matches, they they do. Um, Danielson hit one, so he's hit, got a three dives per hour rate. Punk hit dives and Phoenix hit dives as well. So Jungle Boy is being outdived by CM Punk and Brian Danielson um, for success rate anyway. And then the reversals, the thing that I spoke about before, there are more reversals in Kenny Omega versus Ray Phoenix, but that's Kenny Omega and Ray Phoenix. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Jungle Boy... But yeah, Dax Harwood using reversals more often than Brian Danielson, CM Punk, um, Eddie Kingston, and Kenny Omega. So yeah, it's it's really interesting statistics when you compare them. You probably don't have the stats at hand, um, like at the tip of your hands, but I'm curious how this would compare to, say, uh, more of like an old school match, like, say, maybe Cody versus mm-hmm. Jericho, um, which is a much slower paced match in, in the way that they're doing it. What about Cody versus Dustin? I can whip that up. Yeah. Because that pro- I, that's, that had a old school vibe to it. Yeah. And while you pull that up, another interesting thought I had was um, Brian Danielson versus Minoru Suzuki. They had much a, a really strike dominated match, but yes. I feel like those mm-hmm. two could have a real they could have a really interesting grappling match because of course Danielson's got that technical pedigree from when he was in ROH and, and mm-hmm. Minoru Suzuki, even though like he's known now for those big strike exchanges when he yeah. was in Pancrase and an MMA fighter, he was useless um, at striking. <laughs> he was absolutely right. useless at it. And he won through grappling and through his, his knowledge of jujitsu. Um, and, and basically he was a grappler. Yeah, yeah. His mission wrestling was what he did. Um, so I think those two could have a very different match if they wanted to. Um, that's of course yeah. for one day down the line when we do the Danielson versus Suzuki AW match guide. But yeah, how does this compare to, to like one of those more methodically um, paced matches? Yeah, so Suzuki's actually a really interesting wrestler to watch when you start looking at these kind of things. Um, he's used zero grapples in that match against Danielson. Yeah. That's quite normal for Suzuki. Yeah. The way he actually wrestles is he uses submission holds and strikes for like the whole match. He also almost never uses a pin attempt unless he's going to win. Um, his statistics usually look like like loads of strikes, a bunch of submissions, one or two grapples. Um, and then one or two pinfalls, depending on whether or not he wins. Um, and that grapple that he uses is usually that gotch style pile driver right at yep. the end. Sometimes mm. that's the only thing that he does apart from um, strikes. Yeah. And which is cool because it's good yeah, to he, have. You know, he knows what pops starts. the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the Dustin Cody match, it, they may be kind of spruced up a bit. I know Dustin is trying to fit in with the new crowd. So mm. they're doing like 40 reversals an hour, which is um, not not too way less is, than this yeah. one. Though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not too dissimilar to Danielson and Suzuki. Uh, more or than Kingston, Kingston versus Punk. Yeah. Sort of 100 strikes each per hour, give or take um, around 15 to 20 grapples. Uh, Cody does eight dives per hour in a 22 minute match. So that's like three two or three dives uh cody does loads of submissions so yeah it's um it's it's quite it's kind of halfway between this match and the danielson suzuki yeah. match the yeah cody does one is 
Interesting. That's uh, thank you for thanks for bringing those up because I um, I'm nice. really yeah I, I think it's really interesting how it does compare to those. Um, it's mm. not what I thought um would happen just on face value, but that's that's a really interesting thing. That's, that's one the of the point. reasons yeah, I love your, your site is because of how it reveals these things, particularly what you mentioned about Suzuki. Like I, I just wouldn't mm. have thought of that unless you you brought it up there. So so thank you the, for bringing that. Um, the interesting thing about that is the guy that's reminding me of Suzuki at the moment is Danielson. Since he turned heel, he is very strike based, lots of submissions. Oh, I absolutely sometimes, see that. Yeah, sometimes grapples, yeah. but he's often winning matches with like zero pin attempts, which is quite unusual in wrestling. But I think it's really cool. I think it's good when you've got guys that are having such different, distinct styles. I think it makes it far mm. more interesting. Yep, absolutely. Diversity, absolutely, all for yeah, it. Yeah, Particularly exactly. when you've got a wrestler like Danielson who's doing it and is just so excellent mm-hmm. in his way of executing it and building the matches around these sorts of things. So, yeah. Uh, let's We'll get back to the actual match itself, um, the legacy of this match, um, in, dispensing with the comparisons to the other ones. Um, as you mentioned, this was sort of, was sort of leaked out that this was something that people should watch. Uh, it was also sort of reported at the time that, Everyone knew Jungle Boy was like a great athlete, but Dax really, he wanted a goal. His goal was to make Jungle Boy a super face coming out of this. We sort of mentioned, I I said, this is when Jungle Boy becomes Jungle Man. Um, But looking back with hindsight, what effect do you think this match had on his career? I think it's a great first step. Um, Well, maybe second step if you include the Cody stuff. I suppose... It's, it, it achieved what you were saying that Dax wanted to achieve there. It was the perfect way to make him like a super baby face. But also it did so without relying on his diving, like his, his high flying ability, his high risk moves. Although he tried to pull them out, they weren't successful. And he won this match by going strike for strike with Dax and hitting big grapples and then eventually like winning the match after taking advantage of a kick out as you as as you said i i think that it really establishes jungle boy as a wrestler here rather than just like an underdog baby face it's interesting looking back at the big pictures for aw mm-hmm. there are there there interestingly there are a company that likes to set the tone at the start of the year and sort of leave notes for yeah. the things it's going to do like a few weeks ago i looked at Kenny Omega versus Ray Phoenix. And that was the on the very first match, uh, the very first Dynamite of the year, mm. that was when the Good Brothers showed up. That was when the Forbidden Door was first opened. And what was 2021? It was like New Japan and Impact Wrestlers and Kenny yeah, dying yeah, yeah. every which where. And like all of that was like the tone setter for the year. And and also for Kenny Omega, like that was a very dominant victory by him ultimately. Um, and that set the tone for the year, the kind of things that he would be doing that year. And then you look at um, this match here, you know, like this is the start of Jungle Boy's push. Or even if I, you know, maybe as a point of comparison, Darby Allen, he had a big start to 2020. He had uh, a, a big match in the very first Dynamite. He he beat Sammy Guevara at Revolution. Uh, he had a, a big start to 2020, and that was the year, of course, that by the end of it, he was TNT yeah. champion, and he had Sting at his side. 2021, we've got Jungle Boy. He gets the Baltimore theme. He has this match. Yeah, what does he yeah, do yeah. next? He's you know winning the Battle Royale. He's next to Christian. This is the start. This is AEW going. This is going to be Jungle Boy's year. He beats Dax Harwood. So you know it's early twenty, early twenty twenty two. You know, a first quarter twenty twenty two. What are the things that A? It makes me think. What are the things that AEW has set up already this year that we're going to be seeing paid <laughs> off, and we're going to look back at the end of this year and go. Of course, this was Dante Martin's year or whoever, whatever's going to happen. Um, but, but yeah, like this was that for him. And also, I think, you know, down the line, we're going to look back at this match as that sort of a, a thing. This was Jungle Boy's first ever big singles win. And, and I think that's going to be a legacy moment for him personally. Uh, and, and as we said, the story of the match was him leveling up in that way as well. Um, mm-hmm. So it reflect it's reflected in the... The, what the meta storyline is going around it is reflected on the in-ring action, which I think is a fantastic uh, thing for this sort of – it speaks well for this this match and, and how effective it is at doing what it what it needed to do. 
yeah absolutely it's um it's very very wrestling it's um yeah <laughs> all all that you were all that you said there was kind of very present within within the ring um without you know having to be too explicit yeah yeah it's not heavy hand they're not having to like do a 30 second yeah. monologue every five minutes to to tell you yes. what's happening <laughs> yes uh, yes and, and Dax Harwood, obviously, he's part of FTR. He's he's not gonna. They're not gonna be. They're gonna be a tag team for life. But who are just some singles matches that we might get to see along the way? Who do you want to see? So there was a really really good one with Pack at the end of mm, last yep. year. Yeah, it was very good. I I really like Dax Harwood as a wrestler. I I think that if if he keeps this up, I I would love to see him with the TNT Championship oh, doing yeah. these kind of matches against like underdog baby faces like if he had it right now doing lee moriarty dante martin yeah it, it works really well um ray phoenix etc um I, I don't think he'll ever get that but he is definitely useful in this role um being the singles guy before tag team matches as well is probably a route that they'll take so you know if you see ftr defending the uh, tag team championships against top flight in the future then you'll probably get that dante martin match in in the lead up so yeah i i really really like him as a singles wrestler um it's interesting that cash hasn't been given the same spot um since but maybe we'll see that soon that'd be interesting too i i've got very little doubt that he could probably do it uh yeah 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 these two are very they're very smart blokes my my one, I would love to see them circle back to Hangman Page and see a Hangman Page mm. versus Dax Harwood singles feud. And there's there's plenty to there's plenty to circle back there narratively as well if they wanted to. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that would be because they're two very intelligent wrestlers who think a lot about wrestling and think about a lot mm. about how to structure a match. I think they could do something very special if they wanted to. Um, so yeah, you that's, might. You might even get like Matt Jackson Hangman vibes from that one, like when yeah. Hangman is when he's thinking back to everything. Yep, absolutely. Uh, you know, I just put that out in the universe, TK. <laughs> I know you listen. I know someone at AEW listens to this podcast. So <laughs> anyway, uh, last thing I want to want to bring up, as I mentioned at the start, this is a match that I think crazily didn't make the top fifty um, when we did the mm. original definitive match guide. Yeah. Of course, you can still find that top fifty on WrestlingHeadlines.com. Link is in the description of the podcast. But my question is, you picked to do this match because you think it's brilliant. Obviously, I've just you know <laughs> spoken a lot of positive, very positive things about this match. Um, but my question is, looking at the list that we've got, where do you think? this one would uh would fit in if you had your way where do you think this could fit into um the definitive match guide list well i i, I suppose because it's crowdsourced that's kind of a like it, it just it it already doesn't but like if i was doing my top 50 aw matches it's probably coming like top 20 maybe, i don't know i really like this match maybe top 10 maybe around 10 <laughs> um i gave it 4.25 i believe um on the grapple app when which just works out at five and um, i think that's a good rating it was also during the pandemic pandemic wrestling and um, so I, I i do feel like a good match at that time kind of shone through a bit more because of like what it was like <laughs> look for, for me personally i think like a, when i look at the list there's a there's mm-hmm. a, ne- a nice little place where mjf versus jungle boy came in at 31 uh, and yeah. I think these two are these two are very you know they're doing similar things uh, for Jungle Boy uh, and I think around there you've also got Nick Jackson, Phoenix, John Moxley versus Darby Allen, and, and John Moxley versus Chris Jericho, which is you know a little bit more of a high profile match. But that 31, 32, 33, yeah. it, it could very easily slot in with those if I'm looking at it. But if if I'm going up the list. And I'm saying, like, where is a, the highest place match that I think is this is better than is mm-hmm. it would come in 17th. So it would come in front of Kenny versus Pac versus Orange Cassidy. Um, I couldn't put it any oh, higher. Oh, see, I, that, like, but, uh, I like that match. I, I so really do I, like that I don't that like match. it more than yeah. this one. <laughs> Fair enough. I think the yeah. problem with this match is that they're, like, all of those matches that you read off, there's at least one big name in it. So I think, yep. like, when people think back, like, I like this match better than Omega versus Phoenix, but that match is, like, the 11th highest rated AEW match yeah. or something. 
Um, 12th on the list. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's maybe even not a good example, but Moxley, Moxley versus Jericho, I think you said, this is a better match than Moxley versus Jericho, but that match will... Oh, I don't know about always, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that match will always be thought of, because like, it's a title change, it's a moment, it's the beginning of Moxley's tremendous um, AW title reign. Like... Yeah, it, this isn't very memorable, partially because of who's in it. It's a tag guy and an up-and-coming guy. It's not, like, even when you said Darby Allen, Darby Allen's a very memorable guy. Jungle Boy is just kind of getting there. And I think that, when people are thinking back to this, if you're not, like, a proper, like, in, in-ring paying attention to everything, I don't think this match is all that memorable. I think, as well, one of the things that will happen is this match will become bigger as jungle boy's legacy yeah, yeah. grows because he's that that four pillars thing it's now been canonized and as we said this is his first big singles win um and, mm-hmm. and when we did the definitive match guide it was only just after double or nothing 2021 so we hadn't seen yeah. what the rest of the years, year yeah. had for had for jungle boy so uh you know i think i think in the future, this match is going to become potentially become more prominent, hopefully by podcasts like this speaking about it. And, you know, as, as the, the myth of jungle boy starts to develop and, and grow and potentially he becomes an AEW champion down the line or something, people will go, where did this mm. all start from? And, and, you know, this, this match could be very well the place where they point out and go like, this was his first big singles win. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, hopefully hopefully that's something that happens down the line because this is an excellent match. Only 15 mm-hmm. minutes, incredibly digestible. I say, like, I, I literally say it every week on the podcast, but you should re-watch this one if you haven't seen it recently because um, it's, it's well worth checking out. Yeah, Hooray. absolutely. And sorry, sorry. And, and when you say digestible, I think that's, for me, that's a big thing. The longer a wrestling match goes, the better I need it to be. So for to make it like worthy of the time which is a major reason why me and a lot of other people are just not watching new japan anymore because a 28 minute show versus yo match with lots of nonsense is it's just hard and it's you know when you've got time constraints etc so yeah this is very digestible yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Craig, that's all the questions I've got for you today. Um, we've had a had a great chat about this match. We've soaked up plenty yeah. of time. But did is there anything else you'd like to add before we uh, we get out of here? And if not, where can the good people find you? Uh, yeah, no, I think we've covered uh, it very well. Um, you can uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Craig PW Musings and um, the site that Sam mentioned before that. Um, I'm trying to put together is prowrestlingmusings.com. There's loads of these statistics trying to cover like as many of the classics as I can. There's like a top 10 NXT matches ever. Same with WWE main roster and the top 10 AEW matches ever with like all the stats. Um, And currently trying to watch all the Wrestling Observer newsletter matches of the year and all of the Kazuchika Okada Tanahashi um rivalry i spent my day yesterday watching the first two okada's young lion match against tanahashi and the one where he wins the title of tanahashi so trying to trying to get the kind of interesting stuff so that people can see how it kind of um compares and you know how the statistics reflect those matches i'm really curious how that uh that second Okada, the title match that Okada mm. and Tanahashi comes out looking stats wise, because that's a, I, I call that like a great ambush. That is a brilliant match. Oh, um, it's and the really psychology in it is fantastic. I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the stats fall out on that one, because I've got mm. my own narrative in my head and I'm, I'm curious to see how the stats play that yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, look, as I said before, I can't put over your website enough pro wrestling musings. Um, if you dig deep enough, you'll probably find something that I've done on there at some point but, Possibly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, before I was doing this podcast. So yeah, I, I love the stuff you do and thank you for making the time uh and and thank you to the good listeners for listening as well as i said at the start if you enjoyed what you've listened to today you can rate or review this podcast app on whatever podcast you've got um and feel free to find me on twitter sir underscore samuel let me know that you've listened let me know what you thought and let me know what you think of this match as well been really happy to see so many people jumping on board with this podcast um, and getting involved. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what we do in the future. Um, But thank you very much, Craig, for, for joining me today. Thank you for listening and I will see you all again next week. Thanks 
for listening to the AEW Match Guide podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then you can subscribe on the podcast app of your choice so you never miss an episode. Also, feel free to let me know on Twitter at Sir underscore Samuel. I'd love to hear from you. The AEW Match Guide podcast is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where you can find many other fantastic podcasts discussing not just AEW, but all parts of the world of professional wrestling. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. I'm Sam Brown. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Play season long best ball, fantasy drafts where you only focus on the most fun part of fantasy drafting your team. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. Underdog handles the rest for you. No waivers, trades, or setting your lineups each week. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100, get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.